Hello everyone, welcome to the show. This is eBiz Chat, where it is all about business. My name is Rick Zanotti and I'm joined today by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. And like we say in every show, she's she's magical. <laughs> I think you are. Anyway, we also have uh, in studio Harold Muliati. He's our video producer. And we've got a great guest today. He is our very first geodronologist. I love that title, geodronologist. His name is Ron Bell, and he is uh, a drone specialist, a techie, a geodronologist. This should be fun. Here we go. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation. Visit us at www.relatecasts.net. Thanks. And we are back and in that center position of power, as we like to call it. You didn't know you were going to be in a powerful position today, did you? Um, we've got Ron Bell, geodronologist. How are you doing, Ron? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Ah, our pleasure. And you are doing you're in a business that's new it's thriving it's it's something exciting uh, drones everybody thinks drones just fly over people's backyards and take pictures of their neighbors no 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 there's such an incredible amount of work being done with drones and, and you guys are on that cutting edge of uh, i think there's three products you you folks are working on or three different uses for the drones three different market segments that we're focused on um uh, one of them is oil and gas uh Mm -hmm. both upstream and downstream exploration and, and production. Uh, the, um, the, the other is sort of mineral resource or other types of resource exploration type pro uh, opportunities and then environmental and, and uh, geohazards, things like that. Mm. That's interesting. So with geohazards, what kind of geohazards might those be? Well, things like, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, slope stability issues, uh, kind of mapping the subsurface so that we can identify points of weakness where slopes might fail. This might be along a roadway or in a mine site in an mm. open pit mine or um, uh, sinkholes. That's a big issue in, in many parts of the country. And so what we are using geophysical tools for is actually identify and map and delineate those uh, those potential hazards. We need you folks out here in California, in Southern California. We have lots of sinkholes on the freeways and everything else every so often. Sometimes they're big. It just collapses. Um, now, now that's interesting. Well, are you guys doing like a spectral analysis on this or is it other other methods? Well, we we are taking a different path. There are a number of folks that actually are doing things like LIDAR and photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. Uh, from a drone. Uh, I, we, we use those techniques, but what we're doing is using geophysical methods mm -hmm. to actually sense what's in the subsurface. And that's what makes us unique. That's so. interesting. That, so uh, I, I know I was reading some stuff about you guys use mag magnetometers to, uh, for example, find yeah. out where there's metal locations or things like that. Um, yes. Yes. That, 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 in fact, is one of our big application areas. We're in many parts of this country, there has been historic oil and gas oil and gas development. Mm. Uh, it goes back, in some cases, over a hundred years, and uh, very often there's uh, what we're seeing now is uh, those areas are now being developed as residential areas. That's particular mm. in Colorado, where I'm where I'm located. And so one of the things we use drones for is to actually identify where those old old uh, oil and gas wells are, interesting, uh, or where there's pipelines. <laughs> Uh, where they may have not very good records of, of them anymore. <laughs> That's fascinating. You know, it's interesting. We have a golf course kind of about a mile from where our office is behind us. And there, what were there, 50-something capped oil? Uh, I think there were 50-something of them and totally capped, and they built a golf course and homes over that. So that, that's sort of interesting. Is that the kind of same application that, that you folks would be doing? Right, and uh, but it actually is stems from um, a couple of uh, concerns. One of them is that oftentimes, over time, these the, the plugs they put in these wells will deteriorate, 
and those plugs will then allow the the leaking to the surface of natural gas. Uh, Generally, we can uh, we we think of it as methane, but there are other other gases <laughs> that come up with it, uh, and those represent a hazard to the public. So that, in some sense, uh, locating those wells is is actually identifying a geohazard. Interesting, yeah, but mostly, go ahead. Yeah, because I was thinking. Okay, so so Rick is in in. Are you actually in Ventura County or are We're you, in Ventura, uh, Ventura County? Yeah. So but the LA problem, County has tons of methane pockets well, and it's issues. Worse than that. It, it's worse than that because Ventura County, I remember studying the Ventura oil field, it has mm. a lot of sour gas. So you were oh. talking about sulfide. Mm. So there's an even more compelling reason to to make sure that you know what, where the wells are and where they're leaking. Yeah. And we know one of them is leaking in that golf course, and they're, they're working. That, that'll be fixed up soon. Um, and it's, it's fascinating technology, what they're using. It's probably very similar to what you guys are doing, or maybe not, because this is something a little bit different. But how, how big are the drones you folks are using? I've seen industrial drones, which are pretty large. I've seen some that are small. Um, are you customizing these drones? Well, uh, we, we try to use um, commercially available drones that mm -hmm. have a lift capacity for our sensors. Part of that is just to use what uh, have other people deal with the aviation aspects of the of the technology. Yeah. Um, the the drone that we use is is a drone that was originally designed and sold into the movie industry to carry heavy cameras, uh, ah, film okay. cameras, <laughs> and. Um, it's it's uh, made by a Chinese company called DJI. Oh, DJI it's, a, yeah. it's it's been adopted pretty universally in the industrial realm, at least in the realm that I'm working in. Uh, and it, it's a it's a very good drone for what it for what it can do. And we put on it a magnetometer. We hang a magnetometer below it. Mm -hmm. uh, we all, the magnetometer, by the way, that is made in California as well, just to mm -hmm. show a little bit of a connection to California. Um, the um, uh, but we also hang uh, in a couple of EM systems from it. EM stands for electromagnetics. Mm -hmm. And what those systems do is they actually measure the or sense the changes in electrical conductivity of the subsurface. That allows us to say to identify areas where there might be a contaminant plume or maybe something leaking from a pipeline or identify a pipeline or other types of metal objects that may not be magnetic but may be electrically conductive. So what we're doing there is we're trying to address the problems of our, of our client base, which is uh, they really want to know what's happening in the subsurface. How, how far down can those, uh, can the magne magnetometer go in, in terms of? Uh, well, the ones that, w the magnetometer, that's a question we get all the time. And as a geophysicist, I'm originally a geophysicist mm -hmm. before I became, in fact, I kind of bill myself as the only living geodronologist on the planet Earth. Uh, I have to include the planet Earth because now we have drones flying on Mars. Uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, so uh, and in fact, it's really, really good to see that, that the technology is, is uh, addressing the universe instead of just the Earth. So, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, how, far, how far down can, can you actually measure the, the electromagnetic oh. frequencies? Yeah, as a geophysicist, we get that question all the time, and really, that's just a, that's that's a difficult question to answer. We can measure things that are within the within inches of the uh, surface, or th things that are miles deep. Right. And geologically, that's typically what we're thinking of in terms of uh, resource exploration, like oil and gas or geothermals. We're really looking very deep. Uh, in, in the near surface, we're looking for buried objects that are, might be an unexploded piece of unexploded ordnance or uh, an oil well or a pipeline or other things that are, that are ferromagnetic and they're, they provide a distinctive, uh, uh, what we call an anomaly. So, 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 ideally, it, so it, yeah, so ideally what, what you're saying, for example, when you mentioned earlier environmental type work, you could definitely work as part of the earthquake detection, for example, just thinking of something uh, where there would be some some pressure buildups or something that may be measurable from. You could use potentially use drones for that. Generally, yeah. magnet magnetics isn't what we measure for that. It might yeah. be an EM tool or some mm -hmm. other tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fascinating. Okay, but 
But, but okay, I'm sure this is what everyone is thinking. You can use it for pirate treasure. Pirate treasure. Yeah. Buried pirate yes. treasure. I mean, assuming they have, you know, like, okay, gold, I don't know if your EMs pick it up that or if the magnetometers, but if they have any kind of iron fittings <laughs> on their chest, mm -hmm. that... Uh, magnetometry is used to locate old pirate ships uh, off offshore. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, <clears throat> no. Has anybody hired you to do that yet? Not for pirate ships, but I have worked on a treasure hunt in uh, where they okay. where they buried uh, some. Uh, uh, in a, they dug a cave out, and they the 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 myth or the story was that, that there was some uh, Spanish gold that was buried in this cave, and so I. I I didn't use drones at the time. It was a little too new technology. I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't even aware of drones at the time. But I have worked on treasure hunts. So <laughs> interesting. <clears throat> do you, by any chance, know a guy named Mark Bender? No, I do not. He, he's a drone specialist. He was in Hollywood for a long time, in, involved in other projects with with technology like like steady cams and things like that. But he's also now a drone pilot. He's 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 a he's a professional pilot for thirty seven years. But he's also now a drone pilot, and he does a lot sure. of the architectural type work for companies and and things like that. Did I say architectural? No, uh, archaeological. He does uh, also uh, building. If they're building something, I guess it is architectural. When they do buildings, he'll analyze some things of soil structures and other things. It's a fascinating guy. It, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce you two together because I think you might have a lot in common. And he's uh, yeah, he's I'd a, love to talk to him. He's a really interesting him. guy too, kind of like you. Uh, I think you guys would have fun together. And um, Mark's just a, a really nice guy too. And it's just, I, th I think you guys would would hit it off. I'll I'll send a, an email introduction. I would shortly. appreciate that. I, yeah. I I I I find that that I I find it very interesting what people are applying drones for. I'm mm -hmm. as far as I know, we're the only company that's really focusing on geoscientific applications. Yeah, I have uh, I have a friend who's using drones. It's a new company. I can't remember the name of the company. Um, they're down in Georgia, I think, and um, and he's out of Atlanta. And what they're doing is they're using it for large campuses, uh, schools, or large building campuses, analyzing roofs for leakages and stuff, basically helping people protect against roof damage way before it happens. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, one yeah. of the real advantages of using drones is that you're, you're able to have an eye in the sky mm -hmm. and, uh, that, and th therefore you don't have to put a person up on a ladder or some other sort of device up there and run the risk of, uh, of injury right. uh, or a mishap. The drone is, uh, really takes away a lot of the, that risk and danger. And and the speed yes. at which it happens. They said they can go through a whole campus in, in hours or days versus months, literally six months to go through all the roofs in, in a major campus, for example. And Well, uh, yeah. yeah, and the way they, they do the point clouds instead of like a, a satellite image will help in certain mm -hmm. things, but with the point clouds they can actually do the 3D renderings. But mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, and speaking of that, I do know of a lot of people have used drones in geoscience for mapping, but it's for mapping outcrops. Like in, at this point, I say um, most people are doing have field mapping in their in their masters or, or uh, dissertation work. A lot of them use a drone just for for uh, measuring and getting instead of using, like you said, photogrammetry or, or work. But then in terms of what you're doing with magnetometry, it's just takes it at a completely different level. And I was wondering, where do you see the biggest growth in the geoscience applications? Uh, well, magnetometry, since I began, I be became involved with using drones and in particular this magnetometer uh, in 2015, 16. And mm -hmm. since then, um, I, I've seen probably a five times increase in the amount of magnetometry, drone magnetometry work that's been done in, in the U.S. and certainly overseas. Uh, it's really uh, uh, so that in, in a basic level, a lot of this is for resource exploration, for mineral exploration, 
primarily, okay. which is yeah. what we're doing there is we're taking, we traditionally would have flown an, an airborne, a pilot on board an airborne yeah. survey, and yeah. or we would have done a ground survey. And what the drones do is allow you to get elements of both. So, hmm. and so to do generally, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, like, for example, determining where the basement is, et cetera. Well, uh, in, in the reason um, it's used in mineral exploration is we're mapping lithologies, we're mapping ge yeah. uh, rock type and structure, which are very often controls on on the mineralization of this, uh, the deposits. So mm -hmm. um, that's it's a basic mapping tool, uh, ge ge geologic mapping tool. That is magnetometry is. What we're doing yeah. with the drones is we're bring, we're actually improving our sensitivity and our resolution. And we're reducing the amount of risk where that's associated with people or the staff on the ground. And we can cover um, areas where it would have been cost prohibitive to do, to do a, a traditional airborne magnetic survey, pilot on board, board survey. Uh, we can cover those areas at a, at a very economic way today with a drone. And, and I just see that as that's a growth area that when you ask where the growth area is, that is a growing area right now. Uh, what we're also seeing is a growth area in uh, mapping areas that might have unexploded ordnance. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of those sites in the U.S. Um, and we're seeing it like I'm doing it to mapping, uh, uh, locating infrastructure, uh, steel pipelines, uh, legacy oil and gas wells. All of those things have are being driven by uh, in part risk, but also the fact that a lot of this infrastructure was uh, 50 years old. Uh, the, any record of it has been has been uh, lost, and or it just wasn't a, a very accurate location when they when they compiled the record. So there's a lot of interest in that, and I see that as those as growth growth areas. That, that makes sense because in my early career, I started and I was doing some work in mining, and we used um, airborne magnetometers, and it was helpful because we used it for determining the depth to uh, basically the basement and also how deep the, the cover would be like an appliance lake bed. But the, the reason is because like you're just exactly saying that there would be iron content in the um, hard rock that, and so that mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily the basement, but in many cases it was. And, and so it was pretty interesting to see and it was extremely useful, but it was expensive. And so what you're talking about if it's, is, and then it took a while, and it wasn't all, and, and it was pretty general. But with the higher resolution, I mean, there's just so much you can do. And, and um, it's, anymore, it's all about the, the quality of the reservoir. So pinpointing the high quality is really good. Mm -hmm. Or quality, mm -hmm. or body. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not sure what to say to that. I just I look at it as that those are that's a, a, a primary customer base for me. And uh, um, it, it's really it's not doing anything technically much different than, than what we've done for decades. But uh, in terms of it, it's the data collection of it and it's the reduction of the cost per data point that are really the drivers in, in that in that space. Um, and and the higher definition data. I, uh, I think one of the things that, that um, drives all of the uh, use of uh, geoscientific mapping is what, what, how much budget you have to, to work with. And that generally meant that you had to make some hard, hard calls in terms of how, what kind of resolution that you can get. And with a drone, um, you can start off at one resolution. I've got a great his, case history of this. Start up one resolution. You can identify an anomaly that's of interest. You can go back in and, and remap it at a much higher definition. And then from that, with the advances we've had in the computer software and the modeling and the artificial intelligence and all of that, now you're getting a data volume that really you can apply these, these really sophisticated modeling tools and interpretation tools. So um, the drones are play a big role in, in that. In fact, one of the things that uh, you you begin to realize is that you're starting to become a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of data that you're having to deal mm -hmm. with, and so you need to go to go and visit with the people that are that are working on these machine learning and and uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. In fact, we have a relationship. My firm does 
uh, with a company out of Houston is actually doing just that. And uh, they, we supply them with a really high definition, high quality data, and they apply their algorithms to actually extract information about the subsurface. Um, I, you know, there, it, it, this is a really exciting uh, growth industry right now, and that is the utilization of drones are essentially airborne robots. And so we're using the robotic technology to, to remove the human error to some extent and improve our ability to get much larger data volumes that, are, that then can be fed into these programs that start extracting all sorts of information out of it that in the past we just didn't have access to. So. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just thoroughly excited about it. I, I, this is, uh, I, I, can't, I can't express more or how, 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 uh, how excited I am about the, the possibilities. And, uh, and uh, I think that's in fact why we started Drone Geosciences. We, we needed to, uh, we needed to be, bring uh, something to the marketplace that so far hasn't been, been brought. And that is, really a focus on the data and multiple data types and then applying these uh, these algorithms uh, these new new techniques for actually extracting information from the data That's amazing. If, if you give me the opportunity I'll drone on for hours on this <laughs> stuff <so. laughs> uh. That's funny. No, that is exciting. Well, I, you know, there aren't that many things that are that exciting in this world right now that that have so many promises. And like you said, other world too, because it's it's being used now on Mars and probably the Moon pretty soon. Uh, it's it's pretty exciting. And um, now how how I don't know about the Moon? The Moon technically doesn't have a lot of atmosphere. No, uh, I, I don't think we'll see at least the drones that we use on Earth or Mars on the yeah. Moon, but. You know that we're, right now we're we're looking at at aircraft that are that are use propulsion that is uh, dependent on having an atmosphere. Right. In the future, it could be some other uh, propulsion mechanisms for the aircraft. So yeah. it's not out of the realm of uh, possibility in my mind. Yeah, ion drives. Looking for those ion drives. They have them, but very small. I'm uh, so glad to hear that you're doing the um, interpretation as well as the. As as well as the data ga gathering, because I think that's where your experience really comes into play as well. So, so you can do the processing and interpretation. What are some of the challenges? Well, uh, one of the, the the biggest challenges that we have is is making sure that we can identify all the sources of noise that that are, get imparted on the data when we're acquiring it, and then uh, I coming up with ways of actually uh, uh, compensating or removing that noise. And um, that's, that's in fact what we're working on right now. And uh, uh, the, then, then because you want to have as clean of a data set when you give it to a machine algorithm, uh, because otherwise it's going to get fooled. And, and you want to, uh, uh, the, the other challenge is, uh, is not only getting good quality data, but working on, um, I mean, combining different types of data to, to, uh, uh, together, whether it be electromagnetic data or remote sensing data like uh, the hyperspectral or the shortwave infrared mm -hmm. um, or things like uh, uh, thermal infrared. Uh, that, those are all very collaborative data sets or can be used in a collaborative way with, with geophysical data, whether it be EM or MAG. Um, and I guess the third challenge, if, if I were to name them, uh, I mean to uh, uh, number them, uh, is, is getting the instrument manufacturers to actually prepare or develop new, new sensors that are both lightweight and low mm -hmm. power and actually help us, help us advance the science. Um, it, some of these sensors are, the sensors we're using now are logical developments. Uh, we're using the magnetometer is a chip-based uh, uh, it's called a, mic a microfabricated atomic magnetometer, uh, and the way they've configured it, I see it as really being very innovative. Uh, and now, if we can do that for other other geophysical or other geoscience sensors, that's just going to continue to advance our ability to understand what's happening with the Earth and in the subsurface of the Earth. And uh, I do everything that I can to try to to uh, encourage the instrument guys to start, you know, start thinking outside the box and and developing new sensors. Oh, I love it. 
So I imagine from a business perspective, it, it sky's the limit right now. Yeah, I would say, I, I don't know if you meant that as a pun, but it certainly is. <laughs> is it, it, we are limited in how high we can fly though, because of the FAA, but right. uh, you know, <clears throat> but we can, we can talk to the FAA about uh, allowing us to fly higher if we need to. <clears throat> right. Uh, most of the work that I'm involved with, I actually want to fly closer to the earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when mm -hmm. I'm closer to the earth, the signal strength gets better. Right. And when the signal strength gets better, uh, that means I can pull more information out of the, about the subsurface, out of, uh, out of the data volume I'm collecting. That's fascinating. Well, we are just about out of time. Do you have any other questions, Susan? I had one quick question. Okay, so have you had any experiences where you've come up with something really unexpected? Uh, I actually have. I mean, I, well, you know, anytime that you're uh, doing a scientific experiment, or which is what essentially these surveys are, they're individual little experiments, um, you, you have a preconceived notion of what it is that you're going to get. And most of the time, you're pretty close to what is happening. Uh, I just recently did a survey. I've got some signal in the uh, that we measured. I can't explain it. Uh, it, it, it Fortunately, it doesn't interfere with what we were doing the survey for, but it is, uh, it, it's a very unusual signal. And I, I'm, I'm, it, it, it doesn't, I don't think it's anything geologic related. I think it's just something around the area we were flying in, uh, which was a residential neighborhood, which hmm. didn't make any sense. So I'm suspecting that maybe the CIA has some sort of thing going on there. Uh, or aliens. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I like the alien. Or an alien, yeah. You no, never know. Alien. <laughs> That's funny. Well, this is fun. Absolutely. This is this is great. We're looking forward to. I'd love to have you guys back on again, and also bring in your business guy, who unfortunately had a had an emergency today. I hope everything's fine with him. Um, but because it's fun, it's an exciting topic, and 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 there's so much potential to all of this, and. And, and like you said, you've only been like five, six years doing this. That's we're at the we're at the just beginning of this. We are, and and in fact, I uh, I got involved because I realized a lot of what I was doing was I've been doing for this for thirty years, and I figured there had to be a better way. And yeah. uh, I did a little bit of research, and I found out there was a better way, and so I jumped into doing that. And uh, and I it's been an exciting trip so far. Actually, I thank you for. Uh, having me and uh, Susan and uh, I really appreciate the you know allowing me the opportunity uh, I've recently been working with Susan on, on other things uh, more geologic type things uh, that's great but uh, I, I would like to come back if you'll have me in about six months and then give you an update of where we stand with our new sensors and our, oh, our new applications and yeah. where our business stands no that'd be great i'd love to have that right. and uh and i'll introduce you to mark bender a friend of mine um i think you I guys appreciate will, that. Thank will you. probably enjoy a lot of the conversation um this good stuff well thank you so much yeah. for coming on sharing with us and and again for anybody in the audience you have now met your first geodronologist yeah. and i'm sure so far they're the only but, living one on the planet earth so that's I, right. I, uh, and that is something to be proud of. So I think that's cool. And um, and if you have any questions for Ron or anything else, um, I will put information down below, his company information, so you can get a hold of him. Or if you guys are interested in learning more about what they do or if you want to use their services, feel free to contact them. Anyway, we'll have a great one, Ron. Again, appreciate having you on. Uh, good luck and fortune in what you guys are doing. I think you're just on the cutting edge right now, which is great. It's exciting Thank to see you. that. It's exciting to see that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And um, all I can say is, thank God politicians aren't running this. It would be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I had Absolutely. to let that out. <laughs> anyway, yeah. this is great. Um, and yeah. Susan, we'll see you next week, uh, and everyone else on the next EBIS chat. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank bye. you. Have a good day. Thank you. you too. Yeah, they're good.